In our last two segments of this lecture, we're going to examine two anthropological theories of religion. You may wonder what the difference between anthropology and sociology is supposed to be. In truth, they're very closely related, but a standard answer is that sociologists study societies, whereas anthropologists study cultures. Our sixth theory is by Victor Turner, who died in 1983. Turner was born in Scotland and educated in England. During part of his career, he did field work in Africa. One thing he's known for now is his theory of rites of passage. A rite of passage is a religious ceremony that has to do with some great transition in life. There are rites of passage for birth, for death, for marriage, for conversion, for pilgrimage. He analyzed rites of passage as involving three stages. He names these stages using the Latin word limen, which means the threshold. The threshold is the part of the floor under your doorway. It's the dividing line between one room and another, or the dividing line between your house and the outside world. That's the limen. It's what you cross when you go through a doorway. In the preliminal stage, there's a separation from the norm, separation from the normal social practices and organization. The liminal stage is a stage of transition, and it's rather short-lasting. It could be minutes, hours, days, or weeks, but it's not, generally speaking, something where you stay a long time. And then there's the post-liminal stage where you're incorporated back into society, but now with a different status, having undergone this transition, having gone through the rite of passage. The classical example of a rite of passage would be the Islamic pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, which they call the Hajj. We'll look at this in more detail later in the course, but there's a preliminal stage where one travels to Mecca, and one gives up one's normal clothing, dressing in just a simple garment consisting of two pieces of white cloth, at least if you're male. During the rituals of the Hajj, one goes here and there, recites various prayers, does various symbolic actions, then you're in the liminal stage. It's a stage of transition. And it's a stage where the normal social divisions don't really apply. The rich and the poor more or less do it the same. Everybody, in a way, has been equalized. In the post-liminal stage, you travel back home. But now, you're someone who's gone on pilgrimage. In many Islamic societies, you can add an extra word like haji to the end of your name which represents this new status. Another obvious example of a rite of passage would be Christian baptism. We'll consider for this example Protestant baptism, which is done to an adult convert rather than to a baby. The preliminal stage, there's some preparation, some teaching. They want to make sure that you really know what you're doing, that you really do want to become a Christian. There's a liminal stage. They dunk you underwater. Sometimes you're dressed in some kind of special clothes. And then the post-liminal stages, well, now you're a baptized Christian. You enjoy all the rights and privileges thereof. Turner says that rituals open up a space where participants are, quote, neither here nor there. It opens up a space in the normal social structure. While they're in that liminal stage, they experience what he calls communitas. It's a kind of fellowship and bonding experienced outside of the normal social structure. There's a kind of freedom and openness to that space that space of the liminal stage. Because of this, Turner became interested in what he called liminal institutions. These are social structures which are formed so as to keep people in a liminal kind of relationship long term. They prolong the liminal stage and that communitas that it involves. Examples of liminal institutions would be monasteries. All the monks or all the nuns have a kind of equalized status in monasteries, more or less, there's always somebody in charge, and there are usually higher and lower ranks. Other liminal institutions include hippie communities or beat communities. During the 1950s, and more so in the 1960s and 70s, in America and in Europe, there were a number of usually small-scale social experiments where people tried to lay aside normal social practices, even things like marriage and especially personal property, and tried to find a way to, to live together that was somehow better. These people, in Turner's words, aim for, quote, a transformative experience that goes to the root of each person's being and finds in that root something profoundly communal and shared, end quote. 
Basically, he thought that maybe some different way of organizing human beings could do a better job at bringing out the best in us. Honestly, it's a somewhat romantic idea. Most of these experiments did not work out. It's not easy to live with no personal property. It's not easy to live in close proximity to a big group of people, most of whom you're not related to. It's not easy to practice free love. It may sound exciting at first, but within a couple years, everybody's jealous and hating one another, and things are profoundly mixed up. You have to wonder, then, if this is too optimistic. The idea seems to be that your true, natural, unspoiled self is a really good self. And if we could just bring out everybody's true inner self, then we would have a perfect society, or at least a much better society than we have. But what is this root? What is this inner self that normally doesn't come out? And why should we assume that it's a good thing, or that it will result in social harmony? Maybe if everybody just acts all authentically, it'll be worse. So as with Weber, there's not really a comprehensive theory of religion here. But there are some concepts that many scholars find very useful. In our final segment of this lecture, the work of anthropologist Clifford Geertz 